Um, but so like Ron said, I'll be talking about diabetic emergencies. And for those of you who came last year, this talk is a little bit revised and a little bit, uh, the topics have been uh, readjusted to sort of fit the audience type a little bit better. Um, so first we're going to identify and define the major emergencies that patients with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes experience. Uh, we want to understand the, the pathophysiology behind these diabetic emergencies. And lastly, we'll review the treatment of these emergencies. The first one I want to talk about is hypoglycemia. Um, so when I was practicing this talk the other night, um, I, was, uh, I was subjecting my fiance to it. And uh, she's, a, she's a school teacher. And so she, the first thing she said, well, you need to define it. I was like, no, nah, everyone in this audience knows what hypoglycemia is. And I kept on saying it over and over again. But then I thought about it a little bit more. And I think that there are a lot of different definitions for hypoglycemia. So what is it? So, um, the ADA formed a work group in 2005, and there are a lot of other professional societies that have their definitions. Um, so severe hypoglycemia is defined as an event which requires the assistance of another person um, to actively administer either carbohydrates or glucagon or other resuscitative actions in a blood glucose of less than 40. Documented symptomatic hypoglycemia uh, is, something, is an event of a blood glucose of less than or equal to 70 with accompanied symptoms, which are typical, heart palpitations, diaphoresis, alterations in mental status. Asymptomatic hypoglycemia uh, is an event not accompanied with these symptoms, but with a measured uh, serum plasma glucose of less than or equal to 70. So a lot of our patients sometimes will say that they have a low blood sugar. They say they have hypoglycemia, but a lot of times they don't necessarily fit the bill. All right, so how often does this problem occur? Uh, there have been a couple of different um, studies, and the first I'll present is a meta-analysis. Now, they got this data from looking at about 24 studies, um, and really not studies that were meant to look for hypoglycemia, but studies that were comparing incretin therapies versus insulin, sulfonylureas versus insulin, um, and uh, they looked at the incidence rates of hypoglycemia. And they found that in these studies of various durations, uh, within mean age of patients around in the 60s, uh, hypoglycemia occurred about 10% of the time. And they defined hypoglycemia as a blood glucose of less than 55.8. Um, and then uh, in this population-based study, uh, where they essentially looked up in Canada um, at adults age greater than 18 who were newly started on a diabetes treatment. Now, this one, this study was specifically looking at hypoglycemia. They looked at electronic medical records of patients and those who had never been on a diabetes medication before for the last 12 months and were just started. And they looked at two things. They looked at the incidence rates of uh, emergency room visits for hypoglycemia and hospitalizations. Their patient makeup were um, adults mean age of about 64. Uh, the majority of patients were on medications like metformin, about three-fourths of them. About 15% were on sulfonylureas. Uh, about 7 to 10% were on a combination of metformin plus a sulfonylurea, and the remainder were on insulin. And what they found was that they had an incidence rate of 5.2 cases per 1,000 patient years for emergency room visits for hypoglycemia, and an incidence rate of 0.3 cases per 1,000 patient years uh, which required hospitalization. Now that might not seem like a lot. You know, that's talking about in a one year you have to have a thousand patients. And you have five cases. But if you think about that, the hypoglycemia was so severe that the patient presented to the emergency room. They didn't just call the doctor. They didn't just treat it with juice at home. They actually felt like it was enough to call EMS. That that's a pretty significant amount. Um, so in this four-year retrospective analysis, they looked at nearly half a million of patients with type two diabetes uh, that were at least on one oral anti. Uh, diabetic agent. And so, you know, these, this study was looking more at what the, what the cost is. Um, and they looked at ICD-9 codes, inpatient visits, ER visits, and outpatient visits. So first they found that the incidence rate was about 153.8 per 1,000 patient years. About 3.4 percent of their study population had episodes of hypoglycemia, the highest in the age group of 18 to 34. But the costs were pretty staggering. They said the total hypoglycemia costs were upwards of $52 million over their study period, um, which was about eight years, I believe. Um, and this was accounted for 1% of inpatient costs, 3% of emergency room visit costs, and 0.3% of outpatient costs. So we've talked about how prevalent it can be, how much it costs, but what does it cost to our patients? So they surveyed uh, about 4,000 patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And they surveyed them, asking them, you know, 
when does hypoglycemia occur, whether it's in the daytime or at the nighttime, and what are your symptoms associated outside the typical symptoms? So the vast majority said that they had less energy than usual, um, followed by difficulty concentrating, needing to sleep a little bit more, headache, and so on. You can see in this graphic here um, with both daytime events, which are in the red, and blue, nocturnal events, which are in the blue. But then they sort of translated that to further, you know, what did this mean in terms of your lost work time? So patient, and this was a, a little bit, you know, when you look at the amount of time that was work lost, that's actually pretty staggering. You know, in patients who experience daytime hypoglycemia, um, they report that 10% of their episodes led to loss of work time, and uh, that was over an hour of work time lost. And those who had occurred at, in the evening, they had even longer work hours lost, or work minutes lost, I guess. All right, and the last uh, sort of slide I'll present to sort of give you an idea of the scope of the problem with uh, hypoglycemia, uh, the Edinburgh type 2 diabetes study. So they looked at about 900 patients, and they gave them this Epworth sleepiness scale. So they're trying to objectify it a little bit more. And what they found is people who uh, took the survey and were sleepier actually had more higher incidence rates of uh, hypoglycemia, reported them a little bit higher. So you know, this is a, this is a real problem, and I think that um, anyone who treats patients with diabetes can acknowledge that. Um, that some, one, sometimes one of the most limiting factors to achieving good glycemic control is hypoglycemia. I think this has been shown time and time and again in a lot of the larger studies that have been done. So why does it occur? So the obvious one is medications. We give medications to lower the blood sugar, so it happens. Um, sometimes, uh, but through pharmacokinetic imperfections, difference in uh, metabolism, clearance, uh, they can le it can lead to hypoglycemia. In addition, a lot of times there's inappropriate dosing or timing of the medications. There's altered physiology, uh, patients exercise, you know, we just had a great talk about obesity. We c constantly are encouraging our patients to exercise more and more. Unfortunately, with increasing exercise, if they stay on the same diabetes regimen, they're putting themselves at risk for hypoglycemia. Alterations in food intake. Again, we just talked about carbohydrate craving, carbohydrate reduction. The moment they listen to our advice, then they have hypoglycemia. Um, drug interactions are common. I mean, most of our patients are on many, many, many medications, and sometimes these can interact, so it's important to recognize that. And then sort of in keeping with the, the points I was making about medications themselves, any alteration in sensitivity or in clearance of the drugs um, can lead to hypoglycemia. And lastly, our physiologic defenses. So these symptoms that I talked about, the palpitations, the diaphoresis, why do these occur? Now, our body, we're, we're smart. We have, good, we have a good system, you know. Uh, we have mechanisms to help prevent hypoglycemia. Insulin is supposed to shut off, glucagon is supposed to increase, and our catecholamines, which also further will increase endogenous glucose production, will, will, uh, are supposed to prevent hypoglycemia. Uh, but sometimes these systems are impaired, and especially with repeated episodes of hypoglycemia, you could get an attenuation of this response. And so with an impairment of your physiological defenses against hypoglycemia, uh, this can lead to unawareness. Okay, so some general risk factors for hypoglycemia. I'm probably going to sound like a broken record by the end of this uh, talk, but endogenous insulin deficiency, a history of unawareness, aggressive glycemic therapy, recent moderate or intensive exercise, renal failure. So this was, uh, these were risk factors that were sort of defined by um, the ADA work group on hypoglycemia back in 2005. Um, but now I want to shift gears and talk, and, and other than these, you know, general risk factors, what are some common pitfalls that we enter, both on the inpatient side and the outpatient side? So for inpatient, um, like I said, I'm going to sound like a broken record. How many times can you hear alterations in renal function? But if you think about it, you know, patients who are coming to the hospital are sick. They could be dehydrated. They could have alterate, you know, acute kidney injury. This can affect their metabolism of drugs. So it's always important to recognize if, this, if your patient has this, that uh, they may need adjustments in their medication regimen. You know, I would argue that if anyone's done rounds in the hospital, the meals in the hospital look very different from what most of us eat at home and certainly what a lot of our patients eat at home. They're just very different, and so the amount of carbohydrate, you know, we all order a diabetic diet for our, for our patients, no concentrated sweets. It's very different. So it's not, you know, it's not easy just to say, okay, they were on the XYZ units uh, at home, they were on these medications, let's just continue them. Uh, we frequently, you know, when I reflected on days of residency, you know, being in the hospital is not very fun. You know, you're constantly being told, no, you can't eat anymore. After midnight, nothing to eat. Oh, you know what? We decide you're going to have this study. You can't eat anymore. 
And so NPO status, alterations, missed meals because you're going off to get a CAT scan, all of these things can, um, can you know, sort of throw a wrench. And it's a, it's a very fluctuating state when someone's in the hospital. And these are important factors to recognize um, that are a risk factor for developing hypoglycemia in the hospital. I always try to empower my patients that are on uh, multiple dose insulin in the hospital. You know, if, if lunch isn't in front of you and they're trying to give you insulin, please ask them to hold off on that. You know, they need to be an advocate for themselves. They shouldn't necessarily have to do that while worrying about their, you know, 14 other medical problems, but this is another way that we can try to prevent it. And also inappropriate dosing and timing. You know, with the advent or the introduction and the widespread use of electronic ordering systems, you know, everything is either ordered, you know, Q12 hours, BID, TID. Uh, and sometimes this can be done inappropriately for, especially when we talk about insulin, you know. Um, you know, some insulins need to be timed in very specific ways, and if you use the, the generic order sets that sometimes they're not um, done appropriately and uh, medications can be mistimed. Uh, and then lastly, in the hospital, you know, as an endocrinologist, much to our uh, dismay, corticosteroids are used. A, 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 a lot <laughs> for a lot of patients, um, sometimes appropriately, sometimes maybe not so appropriately. But when corticosteroids are abruptly discontinued or reduced, this can lead to changes in insulin resistance and, uh, and also just a glycemic state. So um, sort of looking out for these common pitfalls, I think, are helpful in sort of working to prevent hypoglycemia on the inpatient side. In the outpatient side, where the, I think the majority of us see our patients, the same, the same pitfalls can apply, inappropriate dosing or timing. You know, if we write on the signature of your prescription, you know, uh, mixed insulin 70-30, uh, take BID. You know, the patient has no idea what, what BID means, and the pharmacy write, write twice a day. Well, what does that mean? You know, is that uh, when they first wake up and then when they go to bed, or is it with breakfast and dinner? So, you know, we, we sometimes are making mistakes, and, and it's, not, it's understandable that the patients don't know if sometimes the prescribers don't know either. Um, this is a concept that I think I only really developed when I, was, um, when I started seeing a lot of patients with diabetes, you know. Time and time again, I'll, I'll hear from my patients, well, I have to eat to take my medicine, right? So I, I always eat five meals a day. I always make sure that I have five portions, you know, uh, because that's what a good patient with diabetes should do. Well, this is a little backwards because now all of a sudden they're eating to keep up with their medicine, their A1C is out of control, and then you're going to increase their medicine further, and so they're going to even even more. So you really need to, you know, this can be a very common pitfall that that we fall into, you know, that patients just think, oh, well, we have to eat to take our medicine. Maybe we can even reduce our medicine. Uh, but in the moment that they don't eat, then they can re that, then it can result in hypoglycemia. And really, you know, something that I'm going to try to drive home throughout this talk is uh, patient education. So um, sometimes, as I had mentioned earlier, the patients don't know when they're supposed to take their medicines. They don't know what medicines they're taking are actually for their diabetes. Um, they don't know what to do when they're sick. They don't know what to do when they exercise, uh, you know, intensely. Uh, so these, these are common areas where patients can experience hypoglycemia um, if they're not, you know, counseled by us. Okay, so ways to prevent um, hypoglycemia. Well, first of all, it starts with us knowing what are the medications we prescribe. Uh, yesterday, you know, I was talking to a, a nephrologist. And, and she, she sort of hit the point correctly, you know, there's so many new medications out there, especially for diabetes, for cardiovascular disease. We need to keep up with them because we need to t teach our patients how their medicines are acting. Um, so we need to recognize drugs that can cause hypoglycemia, sophonyuridas, metaglitinides, insulin, and alpha-glucosidase inhibitors. Now drugs that aren't necessarily associated with hypoglycemia, but when used in combination with other medications uh, can potentiate hypoglycemia include metformin, TZDs, GLP-1 uh, agonists, DPP-4 inhibitors, the new class of SGL-2 inhibitors, which I'm sure you'll hear about it later, um, bile acid sequestrants and dopamine agonists. So knowing the mechanisms of drugs for you and then also so that you can translate this into layman's terms for your patients is really important to tell them which are medicines okay to take when you're not eating well, which are medicines to avoid when you're not eating well. Going back to the inpatient side, uh, the, in the standards of medical care for diabetes in 2012, uh, they came up with a couple bullet points. So blood glucose monitoring should be ordered for all patients with diabetes. I think most of us are already doing this. Um, 
they recommend scheduled subcutaneous insulin with basal nutritional and correction components as the preferred means to treat diabetes. And uh, adopting a hypoglycemia management protocol and making sure that everyone in the hospital that, no, that is dealing with your patients is aware of this hypoglycemia protocol. A lot of times the, the physician is the last to find out about it because, you know, a lot of hospitals, you know, are well-oiled machines. The nurses know exactly what to do because they have standing orders for hypoglycemia. And lastly, a plan should be developed to prevent and treat hypoglycemia for each patient. Um, this should always be, uh, you know, sort of discussed as a team um, for everyone who's involved in the care of the patient. Oh, sorry, there's one more. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, when they do occur, because sometimes they do you know, despite our best efforts, that uh, these should be documented in the medical record and tracked. Um, we should, you know, this, should, this kind of uh, can go back into QI processes that can help work to develop uh, other system-wide methods to avoid hypoglycemia in the future. But the only way we know about the problem is if we document it. Okay, so when your patient is NPO, uh, what to do? So for generally what I recommend for patients with type 1 diabetes, it's important to recognize, it's important for the team that might be taking care of the patient uh, to recognize that basal insulin is always required for their patients to avoid diabetic ketoacidosis, which we'll talk about later. For minor procedures, we give about 80% of their normal dose. For major procedures, we typically recommend using insulin, an IV insulin drip combined with dextrose infusion. Uh, it's, it's sort of the safest way to sort of account for a lot of physiological changes that might be occurring um, under, uh, you know, through, a, through a major surgery. And obviously, prandial insulin should be held. For patients with type 2, it's a little bit less um, defined. Uh, we recommend anywhere between 50 to 80 percent of giving of the basal insulin dose. Uh, 50 percent if it's a pro anticipated to be a prolonged NPO status, 80 percent if it's just a quick procedure in the morning and they're going to be resuming their diet um, for the rest of the day. And in general, we recommend holding sulfonylureas and other insulin secretagogues while hospitalizing the, in the, in the, on the inpatient side. Okay, so outpatient hypoglycemia. All right, um, I don't even know if I have to say this again, but educate your patients, you know, you have to teach them. Uh, I, I, I always, my medical assistant always finds these cartoon drawings in my office, I think after every patient with diabetes, because I show them, you know, what is the metformin doing? What is the sulfonylurea that they're taking doing? What is the DPP-4 inhibitor that they're taking? What, are, what is the mechanism of action? Because I think it helps them understand a little bit more what all these things they're taking is. But you got to educate them, because if you don't educate them, then they don't know what to do. Uh, it's just a bunch of, you know, oh, it's the white elliptical pill. It's, it's the red one. It, you know, that, beyond that, they don't really know. They should test their blood sugar before they exercise, um, and if they are running a little bit low, they need to take some form of carbohydrate prior to exercise to avoid hypoglycemia. Or they might need to make adjustments in their diabetes regimen on days that they do, um, they do go to exercise. So I can't, if I had a nickel for every time a patient, you know, started off the conversation, you know, I don't eat sweets. I'm not a sweet person, you know. I don't eat candy, David. It's, it's okay. But, and so we, there's this concept that sugar is only from candy and sweets. But you need to talk to your patients about what else can contribute to their blood sugar. So, you know, when patients ask me, what, what am I supposed to eat as a diabetic? You know, what, what can I eat? Is there any free food that's, that's carbohydrate free or sugar free? The answer is unfortunately not. You know, there are very few things that, you know, in a, in a well-balanced meal that has absolutely no carbohydrates. And you have to teach the patient this and teach them, you know, what can they eat and recognizing that the fact that they drink a quart of milk, it's doing great for their bone health, but it also is contributing to their, their uh, glycemic control. I actually had a patient yesterday that did that. Um, and, you know, really taking a detailed dietary history. Uh, Dr. Pissonnier was talking about we have to sit down with our patients Ask them what they eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. You know, what do they do when they get hungry? What do they eat when they're at work? You have to get an idea of their portion size um, because that's the only way to really sort of get a sense of what they're, what they're doing and sort of how you can tailor their medication regimen to help prevent hypoglycemia. And encouraging self-monitoring of their blood glucose. It's the only way to, to find, I tell people, you know, we don't, doctors don't recommend testing your blood sugar just because we're mean people and we want to cause pain. You know, this is the only, this is one of the easiest ways we can guide our management and recognize hypoglycemia. Okay. Um, the same rules apply. I'm not going to, you know, go through this again, but for type 1 patients, type 2 patients on insulin, um, the same sort of uh, advice holds true for outpatient avoiding hypoglycemia. 
on the outpatient basis. But I think what's the one point that's different is that we really should do um, you know, our job to communicate with the inpatient treatment teams, to talk to them about the diabetes regimen that exists, you know, tell them what your patient is going to do or what you've told your patient to do prior to their procedure. Uh, I think communication is paramount. In treating hypoglycemia, I think all of us are relatively, you know, comfortable with this. Glucose tablets, candy, forms of uh, glucose, uh, juice, a glucagon pen at home. Uh, on the inpatient side, oral glucose is used a lot, IV dextrose, and IM uh, glucagon. All right, so the next slide has a lot of words, and I'll try to kind of um, bold and highlight the, the key points. Uh, so this is in the 2013 Standards of Medical Care for Diabetes. Uh, and the first is that individuals at risk should be asked for symptomatic and uh, ask about symptomatic or asymptomatic hypoglycemia at each encounter. So, you know, that's sort of one of the first things. If anyone has ever seen any of my progress notes, you know, the fir you know in the first sentence is, is there or is there not symptoms of hypoglycemia? If you don't ask, you're not going to, you're not going to find out. Uh, glucose is the preferred treatment, and retesting is, should be done 15 minutes after treatment, and, repeat, and treatment should re be repeated if necessary. Glucagon should be prescribed for those who are at risk for severe hypoglycemia. Uh, and family or caregivers, anyone else who's in the house should be educated on how to use it. You don't have to just wait for EMS to show up. Hypoglycemia unawareness or one or more episodes of severe hypoglycemia really should re-trigger the re-evaluation of the treatment regimen. You have to, you know, think about is this medication regimen appropriate for our patient considering their comorbidities and the episodes of hypoglycemia. And lastly, you know, we talked about the, uh, the catecholamine response, the counter-regulatory or the regulatory mechanisms to prevent hypoglycemia and your defenses. Uh, patients who are treated with insulin who do have hypoglycemic unawareness or an episode of severe hypoglycemia, uh, they should be advised to raise their glycemic target temporarily um, in an attempt to regain a lot of these counter-regulatory responses. And lastly, you know, increased vigilance. We just have to look for it. We have to, you know, ask our patients about it, and that's the only way we're going to be able to tackle the problem. Okay, moving on. Um, what are the other diabetic emergencies? So the next, uh, the two that I'll talk about sort of in tandem are diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. Now, certainly, you know, this is much more prevalent in the pediatric population, but it still does occur with adults. And, you know, in some ways, we've done a good job in reducing the mortality of diabetic ketoacidosis and HHS. And a lot of times the mortality is more associated or more attributable to the inciting incident, the precipitant for this. Uh, but it's, it's still considered, you know, one of our, one of our emergencies for our patients with di diabetes. So this is a slide that everyone loves, you know, everyone memorized in medical school, uh, but let's simplify it a little bit. So, and, and I think it is important to understand the physiology behind a lot of these diabetes emergencies in order to treat it appropriately. So it always starts with an initiating incident, whether it's from an infection, an illness, insulin omission, ischemia, and this, because this causes a relative insulin deficiency in the body. A relative insulin deficiency increases your counter-regulatory hormones. It increases, it mobilizes glucose by um, starting gluconeogenesis, increases the breakdown of glycogen. And this leads to hyperglycemia. In cases with absolute insulin deficiency, with your patients with type 1 who, you know, for one reason or another did not, uh, did not use their insulin, uh, this triggers ketogenesis and lipolysis, which leads to ketonemia. So these two major points, the hyperglycemia and the ketonemia combined, lead to volume depletion and electrolyte abnormalities. And this further, you know, this is, it becomes a vicious cycle then, leading to further hyperglycemia and ketone formation. And, you know, eventually the patient just becomes very, very ill. The definition, um, you know, it can, be, it can vary. Um, there's, you know, uh, guidelines for their pH, their bicarbonate. Ketones can actually be found across all, um, whether it's DK or HHS. Um, and one of the big differences is the pH as well as the anion gap. Um, all right, so what are obstacles in diagnosis? Uh, you know, as we're increasingly becoming accountable for diagnosis codes and hospital-acquired uh, conditions, um, it's important to, to know that the diagnosis of DK and also that other things can sort of look like DK but not necessarily be DK. So DK is a triad. It's a ketosis, a metabolic acidosis, and hyperglycemia. Uh, but a lot of other things can cause each individual item. And just because you have ketones doesn't necessarily mean the patient's in DK. They could have alcoholic ketosis, starvation ketosis, 
Just because they're hyperglycemic doesn't mean they have DKA or HHS. They could just have uncontrolled diabetes. Um, they could have stress from illness, and that can cause hyperglycemia. And sort of a throwback to uh, you know the early days of medical school, other, other causes of an anion gap metabolic acidosis, mud piles. Um, you get bonus points later on if you can tell me what mud pile stands for. All right. So when to suspect. Now, sort of transitioning, a lot of this has to do with passive pathophysiology, and later on what I'm going to talk about is inpatient management. But a lot of the questions I get sometimes are, you know, how do we know? We see a patient in the, in the outpatient setting, their glu glucose is, uh, you know, 357. Is this a diabetic emergency, or is this just uncontrolled hyperglycemia, and how can I account for it? So first of all, you have to think about it, you know, first of all, thinking about it is the only way you're ever going to find it. So patients with type 1 or type 2 and hyperglycemia, Think of it in their differential. Uh, patients who have type 1 and have symptoms of nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, that would be a you know, symptom of DKA, and that can increase your awareness or concern for the disease. And any undiagnosed patient with hyperglycemia, this, this is certainly one of the, um, one of the one, a condition that you have to think about in order to maybe to send your patient to the emergency department. And looking for signs and symptoms. So sometimes, you know, patients with a blood sugar of 350 look totally fine in the office. Uh, you know, maybe that's not such a good thing because they're just kind of always living in that state. But, you know, looking for signs of volume depletion, tachycardia, um, lethargy, weight loss, um, nausea, vomiting, polyuria, polydipsia, those can be symptoms that the patient reports that might increase your concern and, and send them to the emergency room. You can also do a urine dipstick to look for ketones. Um, that's another way that we use in the office a lot of times to kind of determine whether, how urgent this patient is. Initial labs to order. I'm going to kind of go through a lot of this quickly because I'm sure I'm running a little bit low on time. Okay. Um, metabolic workup. You want to get a basic metabolic panel, magnesium, phosphorus to get a sense of their electrolytes, their, uh, you know, their kidney function, something to assess their, their uh, pH status, whether it's an ABG or a VBG, uh, serum and urinary ketones and also a serum beta-hydroxybutyrate, because sometimes the ketones from the serum or the urine can underestimate the severity uh, because they're not measuring beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is a metabolite. And really, you know, I, I say this to everyone, we can't just assume it's because our patients are non-adherent non with our therapies. We need to look for a precipitating illness, you know, whether it's an infection, ischemia, especially in our older populations, and also, you know, it, Going back to the relative insulin deficiency, you know, pregnancy is always something to, to uh, consider if it's appropriate. Um, we'll sort of go through quickly treatment for diabetic ketoacidosis and uh, HHS. Now they're profoundly volume depleted, um, as I mentioned in the pathophysiology slides. You know, in the first hour, you know, aggressive fluid hydration is necessary. Um, even in the maintenance phase. A lot of times when we get calls in the middle of the night, they ask, how much fluid should I give? And the answer is, you know, you know, first of all, you have to give a lot, but I can't give you a magic rate because it really just depends on the cardiopulmonary status of your patient. I tell people over the phone, you just have to look at your patient. You have to see, are they all of a sudden developing crackles? Are they having, you know, is their pulse ox dropping? This is what's going to really guide your management in terms of how hard you can push the fluids. Also looking at their urinary output, and you're really your goals are achieving he hemodynamic stability. Uh, the ADA consensus um, states that continuous IV infusion or frequent, frequent subcutaneous or intramuscular injections of insulin can be used. However, this is more applied in research settings, uh, you know, with treatment of mild and moderate DK with subcutaneous rapid-acting insulin analogs every one to two hours can be safe and effective. But in reality, you know, we're not always in research settings. You know, a lot of our patients have other comorbidities. They might have anisarca, hypotension, any stat a status where you might be concerned about subcutaneous insulin absorption, um, you know, you probably want to stick with IV inf uh, infusion so you know that they're actually getting the therapy. Um, two ways to start the drip. You know, you can either do 0.1 units per kilogram bolus followed by 0.1 units per kilogram per hour, or you can do it without a bolus with 0.14 units per kilogram per hour. If the glucose is not decreased in the first hour by 10%, you want to give another bolus. And really, your target decrease should be anywhere between 50 to 75 milligrams per deciliter in an hour. And if that's not met, the insulin rate should be increased. And once they do achieve, uh, you know, sort of a normalization of, or starting to normalize their blood sugars, uh, decreasing to a weight-based weight rate is recommended. And really here, you know, hospitals across the country have different protocols. Um, Sometimes it can vary based on which ICU you're in. Uh, and really the key is just to know what the unit protocol is so that everyone who's 
from the you know, uh, technician who's monitoring the blood glucose to the nurse who's modifying the insulin drip to the physician who's ordering it, they're all on the same page. And if you don't have a protocol, think about implementing one. Uh, at Sinai, we've developed this protocol here um, that we felt like was easy enough for people to remember without you know, using complicated nomograms or graphs, um, keeping in mind with the target blood sugar of 150 to 200 and a target decrease rate of between 50 to 75. Um, and you can see the um, recommendations based on the rate of change here. Okay, am I really over time? Okay, so <laughs> um, I'm gonna run through these and you have a copy of these in your slides and I, I think that the hypoglycemia was my major point but you know, really you need to know when it's appropriate to transition your patient to a subcutaneous insulin regimen. You have to think about when the, the disease process is resolved and when it's appropriate. Timing for transitioning is also extremely important. So just the pearls for handling your diabetes emergencies, you know, looking for underlying causes for whether it's hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. Don't assume it's just because our patients aren't following our instructions um, or, or misfollowing our instructions. Um, electrolytes should always be monitored when dealing with, you know, hyperglycemic emergencies. And really just consider what your patient is capable of um, when, they, when they go home. And uh, the last is just, you know, really trying to prepare and educate our patients for these possible emergencies. All right, sorry the last was uh, a little bit quick. <laughs> I'm always bad at time. Right, thanks.